So maybe we should, whoops, this works? Yes. Um, get started this afternoon. Um, welcome to the uh, second panel of the day on the uh, general topic of green labels in real estate markets. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Paul Matthew, who is uh, going to be uh, the moderator of this panel. He's a researcher at LBL, whose specialty is really on um, uh, green buildings and economic transformations in uh, real property markets. Paul? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And I think folks are still trickling in from lunch. Um, I'm, I'm pinch hitting for Steve Salkowitz, who was supposed to be here, but was called away at the last minute to DOE for a meeting. Uh, a lot of action going on back in Washington, as, as I'm sure all of you are aware. Uh, but anyway, I'm really happy to be here and quite privileged, really, to uh, moderate this uh, panel. Uh, it's a topic that's near and dear to us uh, at LBL. We've been doing quite a bit of work um, on energy benchmarking tools and the technical methods that underlie labeling programs. And so that's not so much the focus of the discussion today in terms of the technical methods, but more uh, about the, the labels themselves and what they say and, and what they communicate and what impact they actually have uh, in the market. Uh, so we have four uh, panelists, and um, I will briefly introduce each of them, and then uh, each of them will have about a 10-minute presentation, just like the last session, um, and then we're going to have uh, open Q&A, of course. So uh, Doug Gatlin will go first. Uh, he is the Vice President of Market Development at the US Green Building Council. He has oversight for deploying the family of lead rating systems in all the major commercial markets and for managing overall customer relations for lead um, uh, uh, at the Council's new pilot uh, initiative, the Portfolio Program. Uh, prior to joining USGBC, he actually worked at the US EPA in the Energy Star Program which is where our next panelist uh, comes from, Alexander Sullivan, actually leads the technical tools and development team at the EPA's uh, Energy Star program. She oversees the development and maintenance of the technical resources. I've been on several calls with her lately where she really drills down and will really um, uh, fight with you about statistics. Uh, and uh, she also, of course, manages uh, the Portfolio Manager, which is an online tool. Uh, to allow you to track the energy and water and so on. Uh, Alexandra essentially coordinates the statistical analysis and evaluates measures of uh, energy performance in order to update and expand the national performance rating system. Uh, our third panelist is Martin Townsend from across the pond, well, actually across the continent and the pond, I guess. Uh, he's the director of the uh, BRE, that's the British Research Establishment uh, Environmental Assessment uh, Method, uh, affectionately known as BRIAM um, to some. It's very similar to the LEED rating system. In fact, LEED was actually drawn from an initial version of BRIAM many, many years ago. Um, he's worked with the UK government um, to help set targets for zero carbon buildings. He's trained as a civil engineer, retrained as a planner. Uh, does that mean you had to unlearn civil engineering? Probably. Um, and then has worked as a regulator before actually coming to the BRE. And our final panelist is someone who should be a little familiar now, uh, unless you were completely sleeping through lunch. Uh, that is Randall Bowie, who is the chief consultant uh, standards and regulations at Rockwell International. And as you heard earlier, uh, he was very instrumental in the European performance of buildings. Uh, directive. Um, so again, the panel today is going to look at uh, how rating systems work. Uh, so we're going to hear from two of the 800-pound gorillas in the US, that's LEED and Energy Star. Um, how confident are we, in fact, that better scores, in fact, are better building performance? That was already raised a little bit uh, in, in the last session. Uh, there have been a lot of papers out there, and um, that, that's certainly a hot topic. Um, how transparent are they? Is it easy to game the system? Uh, do people understand them correctly? And then, of course, what are the, what's finally, what's the link between labels and outcomes? Do they, in fact, make a difference? I mean, it's curious to me, imagine, uh, you know, five years from now, at least in the U.S., that every time I walk into this building or into a hotel or into a grocery store, there's this nice, big, colorful label that tells me uh, what the rating of this building is. Would I care? Would it make a difference? Uh, I think those are all very interesting questions. So with that, uh, Doug, let's have you start. Okay, great. Thank you, and I think I can uh, probably use the controller from here, so I'll just stay seated. <clears throat> well, let me get right into it. I think this is what we're here to talk about. So um, we've heard uh, a lot of good discussion already, and I, I think uh, I was taking copious notes along with others uh, when uh, Art was providing his data on the California situation and then thinking about how to transpose some of that um, sort of more statistical and scientific knowledge into this conversation, and also what we talked about in the codes panel. Um, I think uh, 
we're looking at how you can fuse together technical information as well as what the science of marketing uh, has to teach us about uh, how to influence human behavior uh, and put that into a system that can actually do some good from an environmental context and from a financial context. Uh, and so I think uh, if my panelists here uh, cover some of the same ground, I just drew the lucky straw to get to go first, and you could just say we worked on these uh, presentations jointly because there may be some things that we have in common here. <clears throat> I think um, if, you, if you boil it all down, a lot of what we've already heard, uh, you can kind of synthesize it into three main purposes for building labeling, uh, informational, purposes, motivational purposes, and educational purposes. And um, I think a, a good example for me that ha kind of has a personal uh, touch to it is uh, from an informational perspective, um, the uh, discussion about albedo, I've had the opportunity to hear Art uh, speak eloquently on that topic for a number of years and yet have not put a cool roof on my house. Uh, so there's the information is present, but the motivation for whatever reason, in my case, probably uh, my neighborhood covenants and just uh, opinions of my neighbors is maybe part of the factor. Um, motivationally, I very much would like to put replacement windows in my house. However, from an informational standpoint, um, where I've looked at the data and run the load calcs, I have to admit that they don't gain me a whole lot of significant additional energy reductions to a lot of the low-hanging fruit that I can do. But I have a motivation to do it because there's a lot of aesthetic value and other value associated with that. And then educationally, I think, um, by bringing these two things together, um, you can take a, a standard or a standard-based approach where you've got a benchmark and you've got some performance specifications and you can make the information as transparent as possible uh, and combine it with things that people want to have, um, such as the, the replacement windows or even, say, a lead plaque on a, on a green building or the designation of having a green building uh, if it adds uh, a certain cachet to the building and also if it is truly a statement of the environmental friendliness of the building, um, which aligns with people's personal motivations. So we can use um, uh, labeling to take the information and the motivational components and turn it into uh, public education. And I think that's seen very well here um, in the mid-90s when the federal government reg uh, required the uh, disclosure, if you will, of nutrition information on a lot of our food products. Um, this provided in a very concise way which is a very important component, and I think in talking about some lessons learned, one of the most important aspects is to take a lot of complex technical information and to put it into a very concise format, where I think if you look at that little table on the nutrition label, you're probably looking at no more than about seven or eight uh, items that the consumer has to review. So make it concise, simple, very simple to understand, um, give it a reference point so that that gives the customer something that, that can put it in a context, but yet it still has to be meaningful. Uh, so I think the nutrition label is a good example of that. And that's why we've uh, in some ways modeled uh, how we think of the lead rating system after that nutrition label. And <clears throat> I was asked to touch on some of the differences uh, between LEED and some of the other specifications. And I think what LEED and Energy Star have an enormous amount in common is on the energy performance criteria. Uh, but just to kind of quickly recap, the, the system of LEED is based on trying to look at all of the uh, environmental and sustainable uh, areas within building uh, design, construction, and operations. And the categories, if you can read them on the slide, include uh, what we call sustainable sites which is where we actually look at factors such as the stormwater runoff effects uh, and also even the transit friendliness of the building, so the location efficiency of the building, uh, which has uh, undergone an upgrade in terms of its uh, uh, relative weighting as a result of some changes that we made earlier this year where our rating system now we've tried as best as possible to align the weighting with the fundamental environmental impacts of the different performance categories and so 
um, location friendly uh, development is a category within that sites uh, grouping and it's now worth about 15 percent of all the points in the rating system because when we really looked at the uh, alignment between uh, that category and the CO2 emission reduction potential um, as well as local air quality benefits of uh, transit friendly development it warranted uh, being uh, bumped up. Uh, water efficiency similarly <clears throat> is a, a category that LEED addresses and had been underrepresented from a pure environmental impacts uh, perspective and has gone through about a doubling uh, in the latest version. Uh, so looking at not only the efficiency of um, water fixtures and, and plumbing fixtures, but also uh, in our existing building rating system, process water use for cooling towers and uh, such as that. And then energy efficiency is uh, really central uh, to the lead rating system and to, I believe, the other rating systems that we're going to talk about today. And um, the only uh, thing I'll add there is um, in, in thinking about how you can get carbon out of buildings, um, energy and the energy services in the building are clearly an enormous driver. Um, but what we've attempted to do is also look at the carbon component or carbon coefficient, if you will, associated with some of the other measures that aren't as immediately uh, intuitive as uh, energy conservation within the building. That takes us to water, it takes us to site location. Um, if you think of the embedded energy in water from the, the uh, treatment and the pumping side and the whole water system, um, if you can conserve energy in your end use water uh, consumption of uh, potable drinking water, you can get uh, in some cases 20% of an added CO2 friendly benefit. And materials is um, also an area where through the life cycle assessment process the uh, embodied energy is being looked at but also this category is trying to emphasize the use of rapidly renewable materials and things that are just good for the occupants such as uh, those materials that that don't pollute the indoor environment and then rounding that out there's a, a strong uh, criteria for um, complying with uh, national uh, indoor environmental quality standards set by ASHRAE and also uh, opportunities to do more in the IEQ arena. So <clears throat> I think what a lot of uh, the labeling programs have tried to look at is how to overcome what are commonly referred to as barriers to green performance or energy efficiency performance in commercial real estate. And just to hit these quickly, and I think we've talked about this already, um, where there's <clears throat> a kind of a lack of standardization. I mean, uh, the building construction industry does not deliver a commoditized product, and I think it's a very good thing that it doesn't, that there's some uniqueness uh, in buildings. But unlike the kinds of standards that we can roll out on refrigerators or televisions, uh, there's a lack of a standardization and a homo homogenization uh, amongst the building types and even the individual buildings themselves. There are smaller numbers of sales transactions in the building market, if you think about it, compared to, say, cars or uh, toasters. Uh, and so there's less uh, data, and uh, the frequency of the transaction makes it potentially less likely for the customer to find the full value of energy efficiency or green performance when they're buying or selling a building. And it's a localized industry, even though there's been more consolidation of late, there's still a lot of fragmentation and a lot of mostly smaller firms, if you think about it. The vast majority of the construction industry is done, uh, construction projects are done locally. Uh, and then, uh, as we've talked about already, the leasing structures can create a perverse incentive if the tenant's going to get most of the benefits without having to share in the costs of the upgrades. So <clears throat> how do we overcome some of these barriers? Well. I think uh, there's a, a comprehensive approach which I've tried to distill into sort of four main items. Um, some kind of standard methodology, whether it's Energy Star, Brium, LEED, or other benchmarks that try to have uh, transparency uh, and a, uh, a, a reference to um, a meaningful uh, data set or a meaningful performance target. And a credible set of implementation guidelines. I know we put together these reference guides that are really sort of the how-to manual for uh, implementing lead projects. So you've got sort of the target, and that helps with the motivation by having the standard uh, performance assessment. And then you've got the how-to that gives people uh, some tools if they're lacking um, on-the-ground knowledge to get started. And you have to have a robust training uh, and credentialing of experts system. 
which is uh, one of the things that USGBC does. Uh, and also then the component of public recognition and disclosure, which is really uh, what we're here to talk about today with the, the, uh, the labels themselves. Okay, and so one thing I would observe is uh, as we've started to work more with the hospitality industry, one way not to try to have a, uh, a system that, uh, that motivates action, provides transparency, and provides uh, useful customer education would be to look at what's happened in the hospitality sector, where you've got essentially one global industry with about 20 main brands comprising that industry, and then 160 at last count green labels of some form or another. Uh, so uh, USGBC has been working with that industry to try to harmonize uh, some of their standards and then to also try to uh, get them to, to adopt more of the, uh, the lead methodology. I just want to uh, frame this up as a kind of a departure point for the conversation. There's been a lot of discussion already about the asset approach versus the operational approach. Uh, I think it's important to note that um, the lead system actually uses both. Um, the, uh, the goal, I think, of both systems is to provide uh, transparency uh, and a replicable set of performance metrics. Um, however, uh, it is important to note, and I'll just offer some food for thought at this point, that um, the asset-based approach is really the only option that allows certification at the time of construction. And uh, USGBC made a, a kind, of, kind of a conscious attempt to focus on the construction industry first and also the, the design performance standard where I think the methodology was simpler to implement quickly. Uh, one of the um, constraints that you have to deal with in having more of a performance-based approach is the availability of a robust set of sample data to provide uh, accurate comparisons. So it may be easier to get started. As far as flaws, uh, it, it does miss some of the energy uses, and it leaves a lot out of the equation, including occupant behavior, which we've uh, heard eloquently discussed this morning. Also, I think uh, it's really important to note that that type of rating all by itself really tends the emphasis of our thinking both on the market side and on the public policy side a little bit too heavily towards the technology-only fix. And it doesn't recognize uh, what we heard Dave Pogue talk about, which is the whole sort of hidden component of top energy performance, which is how the building is managed. And this isn't exclusively occupant behavior. There's been a lot of really good research, emerging research on uh, behavioral impacts of building performance. But I think that um, either a subset of that or a whole other category of that would be in the area of, um, of building management, whether it's owner managed or third party professionally managed. And then just to round out, the, some of the limitations on uh, the side of the um, operations uh, approach is it really is going to leave some low-hanging fruit on the table. There could, you could get a decent score on an operational type of benchmark, Energy Star benchmark, and you could still have some very cost-effective uh, energy retrofit opportunities available to you, which you may not be as motivated to undertake uh, if you've already scored fairly high due to other factors. Um, and I think persistence is the other thing that's important from a public policy perspective. You know, if you're trying to have a program that has incentives or, you know, carrots or sticks or both, uh, that uses a performance-based approach, and it turns out that the performance is highly, highly correlated with factors that have to do with either the management of the building or the behavior of the occupants of the building, then if that changes, you have a performance designation that maybe, maybe moves away <laughs> with those people that were providing the high performance. Um, uh, so that's something else to, to be considered. Um, I will stop there. I put uh, a couple of um, uh, data points in the slide that will be available on the website. And uh, I think just one of the ones, uh, the takeaways that I wanted to provide was from a, a market uptake perspective. Um, <clears throat> LEED has registered about uh, 2 billion square feet of commercial real estate, commercial properties, including the institutional sector, in 2009. And there's two interesting aspects of this. One is that 2 billion square feet of properties that have come into the system just in 2009 uh, represents over one third of all of the registered properties that are in the system. So we see we're really at that exponential point of the curve. And this includes new and existing buildings. The other thing that it's interesting to point out 
out is that that two billion square feet is about 30 percent larger than the total square footage of the construction starts within the U.S. commercial buildings market in 2009. So what that's telling us is that we've not only reached significant market penetration, but that um, you know there's going to be a multi-year component to, to obviously achieving LEED certification. If you look at about a three and a half to four year completion rate, and it, let's just say four years, and so you could just divide that by four, what you end up with is still uh, over 25% market penetration in terms of when those buildings that registered this year actually get completed. I think that's pretty encouraging uh, from the standpoint that when LEED was, was started, it was intended to um, sort of look at the top 25% of the market and kind of use that as a reference frame and say, we want to take the, the best practices of uh, today and make them standard practices of tomorrow uh, and kind of move towards uh, that, 25, that top tier, that top quartile of the market. Well, it looks as though uh, we're actually at a point where 25% uh, or potentially greater of the commercial buildings market is, uh, is pursuing uh, lead certification on the new construction side. And then uh, last but not least, this is the first year uh, in which the square footage of existing building certification is greater than the square footage of new construction certification. And I think that's probably the most exciting thing that's happening right now um, within the green building movement here in the United States. Um, as I said a minute ago, uh, LEED is based both on an asset rating for design and also on an operational rating uh, for existing buildings. And so projects that are using our existing building standard uh, will be uh, uh, measuring their performance using the Energy Star benchmarking system. And they have to meet a performance threshold of roughly the top uh, third of market performance compared against the CBEX database. So um, existing buildings are where the carbon is. And they're really where the financial value is, too. Um, I'll, uh, I'll say this and then pass the, uh, the baton. We had a large REIT come to us uh, about six months ago and say, well, we've built a LEED building. And now we've got uh, 500 other properties nationally uh, that are existing buildings. Um, our industry cannot tolerate this bifurcation of having one or two properties that are green certified and then the rest of the, our portfolio that isn't because we've accepted the premise that green certified buildings are financially more valuable. And from an economics perspective, that means that that other 99% of our portfolio, which is not LEED certified, is of lesser value than those handful of buildings that are. So uh, they've been pushing us very aggressively uh, to try to make our existing buildings rating system a little bit more fluid and scalable for wholesale adoption at the portfolio level. Um, and we've, we've made some good progress there, and we've got a volume certification program that we're piloting. But I think that's probably the most encouraging thing that we're seeing in terms of our market penetration statistics is the direction that this is heading is sort of leap, uh, leveraging off of that initial asset-based rating system where it was truly the architects and the construction firms that were driving it in the market. And now it's uh, owners and investor owners of large real estate portfolios that we see uh, really taking it to the next level. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, thanks, Doug. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Energy Star rating system a little bit, the way that, that Doug talked about LEED. And then uh, from that, I'm also going to talk more broadly about rating and disclosure um, and some of the benefits and the, the different places where we see it in the market. And I think there are different applications in the market that are emerging at, all at fast rates. Um, and from what we've seen, I'm going to address some of the keys to success uh, for rating, label, and, and disclosure policies. Um, and then I'm not actually going to take questions until the end, so you'll have to hold them. Uh, so a couple quick uh, background on the Energy Star ratings. Um, I, know, I know Paul said this is not a technical panel, uh, but I am from the technical side. And, and I do think that the underpinnings of the information on the label are really important because that's what you're trying to communicate. And so you can't really have an informed discussion without addressing what the numbers, in fact, are trying to assess. Um, when the Energy Star rating was established 10 years ago, there were a few key objectives set forth. 
uh, under the umbrella of the Energy Star program, we're trying to help businesses protect the environment through superior energy efficiency. And we identified that it was very important to do this through strategic management approach, that we're not uh, focused on a specific technology, uh, but that we are focused on uh, the whole approach to energy management. And in order to facilitate that, we wanted to create a simple metric that could assist in management um, that could be understood at all levels of an organization, inside an organization, outside of an organization, to do, I think, the exactly what Doug was putting forth in front in terms of informing, uh, motivating, and educating folks about buildings. So uh, the way that our system works, um, we identified some key characteristics for the rating. Uh, one is that it should be based on actual build energy data. Um, it's important uh, because modeling can sometimes uh, not account for certain operational parameters to look at the actual measured performance. It's also important to have a measure that addresses the whole building so that you can capture interactions among the systems within the building. And it is important to account for changes in weather and operation over time. On the panel this morning, we heard what, you know, what about the building that's open 24 hours a day versus the one that isn't. Certainly, those are factors you need to account for. Um, and finally, we wanted something that provided a peer comparison so that you're not looking at yourself over time only, but you're also understanding how you compare to other uh, buildings. The basic steps in our process are to look at national survey data. For the most part, we rely on the CBEX survey conducted by the Department of Energy. Um, using that survey data, we develop regression models that predict energy use, and those models are specific to different types of buildings, for example, offices, hotels, schools. Um, and then uh, for each building, we have the actual measured consumption as compared with the prediction from that model. And we look at that difference and the distribution of that difference across the population to create a 1 to 100 scale uh, on which one point uh, represents one percentile of buildings. Uh, so those buildings that are in the uh, top quartile score a 75 or higher, and those are the ones that can earn the Energy Star label. Um, based on that approach, I think it's important to just clarify a few things that the rating does accomplish and a few things that it's not really trying to accomplish. Um, it does evaluate actual build energy data relative to the building operations. It does normalize for key operational parameters that may constrain the operation. Um, and in order to do those things effectively, it does depend on a statistically representative sample of measured energy data. Uh, the rating does not attempt to sum up the energy consumption of each piece of equipment within the building, um, nor does it provide specific normalization or credit for technology, price, or other factors. Um, so because of that, the rating explains what level of performance you are at, but does not tell you what specific actions will make you go up or down the scale. Um, so we do have those ratings available for 13 spaces right now, ranging from offices and schools uh, to our most recent rating that was released, which is for uh, houses of worship. Um, and our next one uh, coming out for release in April will be a 1 to 100 rating for computer data centers. Um, all of our ratings are accessed through our online tool, Portfolio Manager. Um, it's a free online tool, and it does allow tracking of energy, weather normalized energy, emissions, costs, and water consumption. And then for those 13 spaces which we have ratings, you can get the rating. And of course, through Portfolio Manager, there is also the platform to apply for Energy Star recognition in the form of the Energy Star label. Um, the Energy Star label itself is available as I mentioned, only for the top quartile. Um, however, there are other outputs from Portfolio Manager that could be used for any building along the spectrum of performance. Um, we do have a statement of energy performance that can be generated within Portfolio Manager, basically summarizing the primary energy characteristics of your building. So maybe this is our version of, of Doug's uh, food label for a building. Um, and it does have, as you see, a mark where a certified professional, such as an engineer, could attest the information is true and accurate. Um, this might be a little in the weeds, depending on the application of your label and, and what you're looking for. So we do also have a, a much more simple label available within our system, which is the high level indication of your performance. Um, so for some applications, this one might be more appropriate. It's a first level. It's a little bit easier to understand. There's less information. Um, and so the, all of those are available, and I think they all fall under the category of label, uh, depending on exactly where, you, where you're going to use that label and that rating. Um, so that sort of brings me to my second part of uh, my talk, which is sort of how do we use these ratings and, and what do we disclose and what are the benefits of that? 
Um, I think um, there are a few key benefits. One is that the rating can help you to identify inefficiencies within your building. I think we've already heard today about the um, enormous potential for energy efficiency in the commercial building market. So certainly ratings are one way to help us understand and tap that potential. Um, I think ratings are also useful because they can provide a whole building assessment, which will complement any assessment of specific technologies at the building. Um, when you have a rating, you can track over time how the rating changes. So this can help you to improve performance. Um, and in addition to pr improving performance, it can also help you make sure that you, in fact, maintain a high level of performance and have the persistence of savings. And so um, we have seen that with Energy Star, we are having exponential growth in our new Energy Star labels every year. But also, about 40% of the labels each year are actually from buildings that come back year after year because they are able to maintain their high performance. And I do think that the persistence of savings is extremely important as well. Um, so given those benefits, I think we've seen a growing interest in using ratings and then labels of different sorts um, in, in really all segments of the market. Uh, ratings have, are used internally within businesses and organizations for their own energy tracking, um, disclosure within an organization, for example, to regional store managers or regional portfolio managers. Um, it can be a source of competition within an organization to have the most energy efficient region. Um, there are also some public organizations that are increasingly opting for voluntary disclosure of their performance information. Um, and those are sort of some of the main sort of organizational applications we see. Um, then I think there's also more of an outward focused real estate and commercial application of labels um, and of ratings. And that's something, for example, that we see in CoStar, the multiple listing service, which does include LEED and Energy Star certifications, um, along with other building information. Um, and also with hotel services, where increasingly we're seeing uh, websites forecasting and uh, explaining green labels, hopefully not all 160, uh, to help consumers make de decisions. Um, a third area where we're also seeing a lot of growing interest is in mandatory disclosure legislation. Um, we spoke about AB 1103 this morning. Um, there, that's a legislation that targets time of sale. Um, there's also legislation focusing on annual disclosure. Um, that's been passed in the District of Columbia and will take effect next year, um, and that is uh, under discussion uh, within New York City as well. So I do think that um, it's important when we talk about this application of labels that we consider the different places where ratings and labels impact the market and perhaps the different challenges and, and benefits um, of, of approaches within each of those contexts. You know, There may not be a one-size-fits-all solution. I showed that we have a few different labels available within Portfolio Manager, um, and I do think the context is important. Um, last, oh, if, you, if you are interested in the uh, governments that are leveraging Energy Star and ratings, such as New York City and um, other local localities, I would encourage you to go to our website and you can learn more about those. I assume you'll have access to these presentations. Um, and the last item that I wanted to discuss is some of the things that we've seen as being really critical to having a successful label in the market and, and disclosing information in a way that's really accessible and does motivate that action. Um, one of the keys that we've seen is that it really is important to use measured energy use data. It's Im important that you understand whether or not technologies that you've invested in are in fact yielding the performance that you had desired, and, and if not, trying to account for that difference. Um, another key topic is data verification. Um, it's extremely important to have some sort of method in place for ascertaining that data is complete and accurate. Um, we do that through uh, verification by a professional engineer. Um, but however uh, that is pursued, I think if folks are making real estate or other decisions based on this information, that monitoring and verification of information is very important. Um, another critical component is accessibility of the system. You do need something that is simple and easy to understand. Um, and you also need something that keeps costs at a, at a minimum so that cost is really not a barrier to compliance or to use of the label within the market. Um, and the last item that I think is really important is consistency. 
Uh, it's, it's very helpful to have metrics that can be used straight from design through construction and operation. Um, we do allow for, with an energy start, you, you to put your model design energy into our tool and actually it will forecast what your rating will be if in fact you meet that design target. Um, so you can work with the design target right through uh, your construction occupancy. And I think having those standardized measures that you can use at every step of the way is also really important to have uh, comparison and, and to really evaluate whether your new building is, is operating as you intended. Um, so those are some of the key things that, that we've learned, and I look forward to discussing them more uh, after my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wasn't expecting to have any slides, so uh, in the interval I've actually generated one slide which I just want to share with you. Um, what I want to try and do, I suppose, is, is pull together what we've heard from the panellists here, but also some of the conversations earlier today and actually put um, into context, if I can, what are green rating tools trying to achieve and, and why do they have a place in the marketplace in terms of driving change? What, what is the, the market transformation we're trying to achieve? Um, quite hastily pulled together, so probably too many arrows and too much text, but uh, bear with me on that one. Uh, for me, I, I see there are four uh, elements to this debate in terms of what uh, rating tools are trying to achieve. Uh, that's about exemplars. If we are trying to take the industry, if we're trying to take professionals on a journey, we need to demonstrate to people what that future looks like. Uh, we've heard today about zero carbon. If we're saying to people, uh, we need to get to position at some point, whatever that country decides of zero carbon, we need to be able to demonstrate to people that future is not a scary place to be, it can be achieved. So exemplars are important in terms of giving the industry confidence. And, and I can imagine, like most of us here, we've all worked with developers where if they're taking a risk, if they're being the first to market to achieve a technology or something new, it's a very scary place. But if you can actually demonstrate to them it's not as scary as they think it is, uh, that actually gives them a degree of confidence and actually speeds up uh, the rate of change. Uh, in that exemplar, uh, we need to make sure, as we've heard several times today, this is not just about new build. The new build is the easy bit. Uh, it's very easy to take existing standards and in incrementally uh, increase the performance against those standards. Uh, the challenging bit is the existing stock. Uh, it's where the biggest uh, gains lie, not just in energy, but in water and in waste, in many ele elements. So we need to make sure that when we talk about exemplars, we need to talk about the whole life cycle of buildings. We need to make sure we go from the design and the construct, operation and the end of life in terms of uh, demolition and refurbishment. So that exemplars really need to give the industry some confidence about what we're, we're talking about. Uh, the other element within that, that process is we need to make sure we build buildings that people want to live in. Uh, we've talked a lot today about uh, buildings, but we haven't talked about the people. Uh, we need to make sure that if we're creating an environment it is an environment that people want to work in, to live in. Equally, we need to make sure it's an environment they can afford to live and work in. Some of the technologies which we've been talking about are very expensive. So when we talk about the, the scale of intervention, we need to talk about what's the right scale of intervention. Is that at a component level? Is that at a building level? Is that a site level? Is that a neighbourhood, a city or a region? Each of those levels of intervention give us a different cost envelope. So if we want to make a building highly sustainable, we can do that, but we might find we do that in a way that's very expensive, which no one can afford it. But by looking at a wider scale, looking at a neighbourhood level, using different technologies, we might find it's different. So we need to make sure we have uh, assessment tools that can actually assist and help people make those decisions. We also, as we've heard several times today, need to have in that exemplar uh, labelling to give that transparency so that when you walk into a building, you can sample uh, and understand its performance. Uh, I think this building here is quite a, a very good example, but it could go further. Um, I was in the restroom earlier today. They have waterless urinals, but they don't say anywhere in that room about how much water they're saving. They do not use the space to educate people in terms of what they're doing, in terms of demonstrating to people why they've taken a decision. We can do much more as we exemplar in terms of demonstrating and communicating. Um, the other element, the, the, the northern part of my, uh, of my diamond, if you, if you want to look at it that way, is enable. Uh, 
Once we understand the direction of travel, we need to build the capacity. We need to build the skills, the technology to help that process along. Uh, if we're talking about uh, low or zero carbon buildings, as, as I use that as my example, we need to understand what skills and technology we need in the marketplace to drive that change. That's important to give the industry some confidence. If they're going to invest in the future, the skills and technologies they're investing in terms of their people uh, or in terms of the technology they're putting into buildings, they need to have confidence that technology will stand the test of time. So we need to enable that. We need to incubate that skills and technology to help people on that route. Um, the other part of, of, of my diamond is enable. Um, there's some interesting points here which I, I want to share with you. Uh, one I think is a really good example is, uh, is COP15, Copenhagen. Uh, it's a very good example where, uh, although LEED and, and, and Bree may be competitors, uh, as are the other rating tools, we've decided that because the climate change agenda and the impact that buildings have within that agenda is so important, it rides above competition. And so at Copenhagen, we've got a consistent message which is going to the various representatives there about ensuring that we measure the impact of buildings in a consistent way. So effectively, when it comes to carbon, uh, the way that we measure through the rating tools, the main rating tools internationally, is consistent. So you have a, a building that's being assessed and certified in the States, and you compare it with a building anywhere else in the world against one of the leading methodologies, we can start to measure that impact in a consistent way. That's important because that allows us to have a greater level of knowledge transfer. So if we can understand what the, the, the impact of a building is in kilograms of CO2 per meter squared per annum per building type, and we can start to share that knowledge, we can enable those new markets that we talk about. We talk about carbon trading, but we will never get to that point unless we start to measure things in a consistent way. So we need to start to communicate and engage people in a way that is consistent. Uh, so that's a part of the enable. Under encourage, uh, there's a whole load of measures here, which some of which um, rating tools do and uh, other parts that they don't do, but it, it starts to, to demonstrate how we can work with various governments. Uh, from a BRE perspective, we will work with uh, a large number of, of governments across Europe where we start to uh, give them information about the performance of their relative buildings and say, OK, so your building's performing in a particular way. Uh, it's not as good as uh, other countries in Europe. You need to look at what regulations they have in place. You need to understand uh, what fiscal measures they have in place. So to encourage people, maybe education is part of that process, but the only way you're going to drive change is to actually put some fiscal measures in place. And as part of that same uh, encouraging, it's about league tables. Uh, we've talked about um, exemplars. We've talked about the best in class. Uh, we also need to demonstrate where people are not performing uh, particularly well. And so the various directors that are coming out of Europe in particular are starting to get corporates very, very worried because there could be a label on their building that says this is a very poor performing building. Uh, they can sell themselves very well through their corporate reports. But if the first experience a client has is walking into their building and on the front door or on the, in the lobby there's a label that says this is a poor performing building, what kind of image does that give? So there's a higher level of transparency that's actually emerging in Europe uh, which is starting to drive this debate in, in, a, in, a, in a very positive way. Um, so those are the kind of things I think we've talked about today. And those are the kind of things that rating tools can do in terms of driving change. I think for me, we are going through a change of consciousness. Uh, I think this, this discussion today and many other discussions that I've attended is demonstrating to me we're going from uh, consciously uh, incompetent, consciously competent. We understand we need to do something. We don't know what we need to do. And I think the forums we have here and the way we communicate <coughs> consistently is important to, to maintain that state of consciousness. So a closing slide for me. I was told I had 10 minutes. So I'm, I'm hoping I'm, I'm on time. If we're talking about sustainability and green buildings, it is about energy, but it's not just about energy. We need to make sure we look at the social and the environmental and the economic issues side by side. When we talk about sustainability, we need to make sure we want to build buildings that people can afford to live in and want to live in. Uh, we need to look at the scale of intervention to make sure that have we understood the best way of achieving high standards? Is that about the component or is that about the neighborhood or the city? What's the best way of actually driving change? Is that a policy intervention or is that about educating people? We need to think about new and existing buildings. 
the biggest challenges in existing buildings, we've got to make sure we don't walk away from that. We've got to make sure we walk into that and really actually help people to understand how we can improve their performance. And we need to do that in a way that is completely transparent so we can actually increase that knowledge transfer uh, internationally so that people can understand where best practice sits and, that, and we can gain our experience from that as quickly as possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you. What I would like to do in my uh, few minutes is to take uh, and put on my um, industry hat a bit and look at what is happening in the, in the EU from a point of view of not only energy use but sustainability because as I've mentioned earlier, there, are, there is a lot of activity in the energy legislation now which is looking at the energy use phase. <clears throat> And more recently, there's an attempt to move into sustainability. So I'll try to cover both of them, but I'll do it more from a, looking at an industrial, but keeping in mind that uh, I know pretty well what the EU is trying to accomplish. Because most of the binding legislation, in fact, the only binding legislation now in certification, as far as buildings, is in the um, Energy Performance of Buildings uh, Directive. It does require, as I said, to have a certificate when you build, when you construct, sell, or, or rent, rent out a, um, a building. And the public sector has to actually display that. This has been evaluated, this methodology on the use has been evaluated, and the conclusion is that it has r rather limited effect on the um, value of the buildings. That is to say that the uh, buildings which have been given a high rating, like an A rating, have not been able to get a higher price when they were sold. This has been debated heavily in the EU. Is, uh, is this true? Is, and they said actually the only way to make it have any impact is to connect it to a, an incentive, to, to, a, to some type of a measure which if you have an A, then you get a lower uh, you know, property tax, you get a lower interest rate, and so forth. It was, and this, I think, can be traced back to the fact that the legislation, the way it was developed, allowed member states to have relatively diverse, non-harmonized ways of communicating, not only of calculating, there was a certain amount of flexibility in the way they calculated the certification of the building, the performance of the building, but even the way of communicating it because there were huge differences in the, in the actual appearances of the label. So I think this, through the, since, 19, since 2006 is when actually you had to have a, a building's label. I think the fact that it wasn't harmonized at EU level led to a, in many member states, weak, uh, weak labels, labels which were not well developed, which were not well carried out. This, I think, undermined the, uh, the value of these. Recently, a study in the Netherlands, actually, and the Netherlands is one of the member states which has had a fairly good implementation of the uh, buildings label, because in fact, it was one of the first to have labels even before it was required by the EU. They actually did discover a statistically significant difference in the final sale price of uh, A-level houses as opposed to B-level. So there is finally in some member states evidence to the fact that you can get, even without financial incentives, you can get uh, uh, differences. And of course these price differences become much more when they are connected to, uh, to financial incentives. But th what is happening now in the, in the EU is that you have a, uh, the man, I'm talking from, still about mandatory, is that this, the new directive, as I mentioned earlier, will has gone fairly far to attempt not to harmonize because it's rather difficult, but to have a higher level of quality. And this, I think, is having a, will have a 
profound effect on the ability of these labels to communicate the, the value. But once again, this is still only covering the, the energy use phase, which happens to be probably the most significant from at least CO2 uh, point of view. In the last couple of years, you've seen a movement to include this is the generic, we all recognize that. Many member states have been using this in their building label too. It was very effective on appliances, even without incentives. And I think the lesson to be learned from that is it, if you do have a label and you keep it for many years and you don't change it too often, it becomes an accepted a way of communicating, and it does have intrinsic value. It does communicate the value of the, or the performance of the, of the appliance. It worked and has been shown to work on appliances, and it doesn't work on buildings so far yet because of the fact that it hasn't been implemented uh, correctly in many member states. That's a problem. This um, same label, although it's being heavily debated now in the parliament as far as it's rescaling industry does not like the idea of rescaling uh, this because it's very expensive their proposal is to have a plus a plus plus a plus 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 so there, there is an agreement in parliament to actually allow that to happen but they have, in a couple of years they have to go back and uh, rescale and they're not allowed to have more than seven different categories, which means they may have to start dropping the, uh, the G category. But new legislation will require this uh, same appearance, this A to G with the A plus, A plus, A plus plus, to be used for things other than uh, the energy use in the plants. And it will now, as I said, cover energy related products. And that is where you get into, and then I'm talking about the industry's point of view, that's where you get into construction products. So there's a big discussion now on, shall we really start labeling individual products in a building when we're actually trying to get an idea of the total performance of the building? The argument, there is simply that a lot of products take insulation material, the way they are, the environmental impact on the product as a raw material will certainly not, the total life cycle impact will certainly not be the same as when it's put into a building. Each building, each area of the EU that particular piece of construction material will have a different impact. One good example will be um, if the, the water that used, is used in the production of, of a product, of an insulation product in uh, Sweden, where you've got the melanin, you've got more water than you could ever use in a million years. The water weight uh, as a resource would certainly not be the same as in the same product being produced in in Spain, where you have a big problem with water. So the argument here is that it may be fairly difficult to do this on a product level, but if you want to start getting approaching it on a building's level, it makes a lot more sense. So there is a, a discussion now in the industry Instead of spending a lot of time doing environmental impact or sustainability calculations on, certain, on a lot of products in the construction of buildings, take a top-down approach, calculate the total environmental impact of the building, and then calculate what products you can put into that in order to minimize the total uh, environmental impact of the building. So that's the type of discussion we're seeing now. Um, where it's going to stop, uh, we don't know, except that a lot of the tests on individual or impact assessments on individual products have been extremely uh, in, uh, non-conclusive. They don't really give much information because it's very difficult to come to get any consultants to agree on, on a lot of these products. 
So the jury is out, will still be out, I think, for another year on this discussion. But the, the industry is pushing very hard to, if you're going to look at the building sector, take the building as a whole. And I think this goes hand in hand with the leads, and the lead and the BREEAM type of, of calculation, which today there is no mandatory requirement for a building uh, uh, label. There are some voluntary labels. The eco label is a voluntary system which is being used on product at a product level. This is also uh, being used in so-called green public procurement requirements. There's quite a bit of a movement in green public procurement, which is getting close, very close to being. Uh, it's still uh, voluntary, but it's as close to voluntary measures as you can get with EU legislation. And we expect it to have a, an impact. So if a label, if this label, which is choosing the top 20% of the, of the products, if that is, the, um, is used on a lot of products, it will have some bizarre effects if it's done at EU level. If it's done at, in member state levels, it's quite a different thing. There they can put their own weights. They can weight water, they can weight uh, products. But to try it at EU level to do a lot of these, uh, some of these products becomes very difficult. Today, for example, there are echo labels on floor, flooring in buildings, which works pretty well because it takes into account a lot of chemical, uh, hazardous chemicals, and if they're included, then they get a very low rating, or they're, uh, they've become not allowed in the public procurement um, guidelines. But this is now moving toward the fact that we'll have to have a label on, um, probably here too, on buildings to move, to try to get, the, if the ECO label is going to do a lot of work on construction products, they should move toward trying to do the same thing on buildings. And that's where I think we'll see a lot of possibilities of using some of the work that has been done in LEED and BREEAM and even uh, Energy Star. As you probably know, there is an EU uh, EPA agreement with Energy Star on appliances which is very effective. There may be a possibility of discussing that with buildings. Uh, I know it's been brought up in some discussions. Um, what I would like to conclude with is to say that the, there is a discussion going on driven primarily by green public procurement. It has to be much of the industry and many others prefer doing this at the um, building level and not the product level. Lead, because there is no mandatory or efficient mandatory uh, labeling scheme or certification scheme, LEED and BREEAM are being used by industry quite a bit in, in the EU. And then the Energy Star may be a, another option. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think in the interest of uh, both time and opening it up a little bit, let's, uh, let's go straight to op open discussion. So come up to the mic if you could. Oh, there's a mic here as well, so. Good afternoon, and thanks for, is this thing working? I can talk loud anyhow. Yeah, it's loud enough. Um, the expression in America is, does the left hand know what the right hand is doing? And for a long time, I've been very curious what the interplay is between your different organizations. Um, uh, Ray Cole is one of my favorite speakers from the University of Vancouver who comes to the PEC to speak once a year. I have never gotten a feeling that, there, at least from what I read in public, that, the, that USGBC has very much to do with what's going on in England or what's going on with the rest, rest of Europe. But we get reporting about initiatives in Europe. Similarly, um, I don't get much of a handle that what is going on in Europe, which, which in general is always referred to, well, they're doing it much more aggressively in Europe, um, ever translates back here. So you two can work it out how you'd like to answer that, but I'd really like uh, to know what, uh, what official protocols have the organizations created. 
that's a very easy one. I think I, I answered part of that when I gave my few minutes' worth of introduction. Um, we have, among all the rating tools, regular conversations. Um, it's an interesting dynamic in the sense that we are competitors. Lead and Briam are competitors in the marketplace, but we realise uh, that effectively, unless we work together, unless we give the market what they need in terms of some metrics which are consistent across rating tools, we're not responding. And as, as you heard uh, from Doug and as you heard from myself, one of the most important things to, to, to take place is we need to listen to the marketplace. There's no point creating a rating tool if it doesn't respond to what the market needs. And, and what we're hearing, or what I'm hearing increasingly more and more, is we need consistency. Now, for me, that's not about one rating tool. That's not about a single monopoly in terms of how you assess buildings. Because for me and for the lead, I've spoken to Rick Fadrizi on many occasions, we need competition. Competition actually drives innovation. Competition helps service performance to making sure that the industry gets what they want from the assessment methodology. But on the issues which are big and important ones, and energy and carbon is, is, is the one in town at the moment, we need to make sure that if you have a building that's assessed to a LEED standard or a BREAM standard, it's consistent. So we launched that uh, at Green Build at Phoenix. Um, we're now going into the pilot phase of actually trying to actually run that over across a number of buildings to make sure the methodology when applied in different countries works consistently. And I would imagine it won't stop there. I would imagine on the other metrics we might then look to water. And that's about getting consistency around that element without changing the rating tools because they need to be consistent and they need to be workable solutions in their marketplaces. I'd request each speaker to also identify a uh, questioner to announce themselves. So, so, yeah, I can just add uh, briefly, um, most of you know this, LEED is really an amalgam of a number of reference standards. Um, it's uh, fairly much of a derivative system and not uh, there, there have been uh, new uh, areas that LEED has pioneered, but if you look at it, there, it's actually uh, a compilation of over 70 different reference standards from uh, different industry groups, uh, technical expertise, um, most notably uh, the ASHRAE standards that we use for energy and indoor air quality, and then on the energy performance side, the EPA uh, portfolio manager system. Um, and. Martin, you can certainly speak to that from a BREAM perspective, but I'm not necessarily addressing the question about the transatlantic interplay, but I just wanted to make it uh, known uh, or to, to re-clarify that uh, some of the market power that uh, LEED has been able to provide from a green building and a green products perspective is uh, really just by identifying where uh, either industry groups or technical groups have already coalesced around uh, a reference standard and then just trying to amplify that by, by putting it under the LEED umbrella. Hi, yeah, my name's uh, Kathy Fogel. I'm the supervisor of the energy efficiency planning section at the California Public Utilities Commission. So um, I had a kind of a statement or request and then a question. Um, the statement or request is for Alexandra. In the last um, decision that uh, was adopted in September that adopted the billion dollars a year uh, portfolios for utilities, uh, the investor on utilities in California to spend on energy efficiency in California, there was a requirement in that decision um, by the commission to have the utilities benchmark all of the uh, commercial buildings and institutional governmental buildings that they touch in a significant way with their programs. Um, so that's kind of a FYI to the audience. But also we're hearing a lot that the local governments in particular lack capacity to know how to engage with the Energy Star Portfolio Manager and also the more California specific tools. So I think it might be a great um, thing to set up maybe a webinar or something sometime in the future where we can get some sort of mass training for some of those local government officials that are very stretched right now but want to participate in this. Um, so that's kind of the statement request. And then uh, the question is, um, you may, hopefully everybody here has heard a little bit about the um, 
uh, zero energy building um, targets that have been adopted by uh, the California Public Utilities Commission and then also endorsed by the California Energy Commission um, at the time of the adoption of the strategic plan in 2008. And just for the sake of avoiding some of the thorny arguments, let's call it a nearly zero energy buildings uh, mandate for now. Um, but I'm wondering how um, how can uh, uh, lead um, kind of lead help lead the way, if you will, uh, towards in particular we're talking about commercial buildings today towards that zero energy goal, um, which is not only for new buildings that all new buildings. 2030 are zero energy, but also very um, looking for pretty deep retrofits in existing buildings by, I don't know, I think 2020 or something. 50% of commercial buildings in California are retrofitted to be zero energy. Mm -hmm. um, so how can LEED and also Energy Star, um, it's coming out in Massachusetts, how can you all kind of evolve your standards to help lead that mar the marketplace in that direction? Well, just briefly, uh, for LEED, we uh, have, created over the last two years um, a continuous improvement cycle that's uh, going to follow a kind of a standard repeatable uh, process of, uh, of a three-year uh, incremental improvement basis. And so the next version of LEED that's slated to come out would be a version for uh, year 2012. And uh, our technical advisory groups that represent the major credit category areas, energy, water, waste, and so forth, um, they have really aligned around uh, a goal of um, the next level of, of platinum, I'm sorry, the, in the next version, something along the lines of platinum or whether there's even a new category above platinum that gets created would, would really start to require more along the lines of a regenerative building, you know, something that's, that's net carbon neutral and then uh, possibly even sets the stage, and again, this all has to be calibrated based on where the market really is, and, and, and also keeping an eye on all of those laggard buildings that we want to move up the scale as opposed to just the superstars that, that we want to incentivize. But um, that's sort of the, the approach right now, is a three-year continuous improvement process, and then every th three years, every iteration would ratchet the standard up a little bit higher, so at least at the high end, it moves above that sort of magic line where you're, you're into a, a more of a regenerative territory. Great. So I guess I, I would, I'd, I'll address both of your comments and questions. <laughs> um, with, with respect to uh, training and, and the work in, in California specifically, I, certainly if, if you want to talk off, offline about some opportunities, I'd be happy to do that. Um, we try to support local governments across the country as, as broadly as we can. Um, we do have a number of trainings, and we also outreach um, specifically to organizations and individuals who themselves train about portfolio manager. And actually, for example, PG&E has staff who, in fact, train on portfolio manager and come to us regularly for help so that they can also basically represent um, Energy Star through training. Um, and we did also, you know, for example, last spring held a several series uh, of webinars uh, specifically for local governments in order to help them understand how they could use a portfolio manager and Energy Star tools in uh, soliciting funds from ARA um, to be applied for energy efficiency projects and how those could, could work for both uh, public buildings as well as commercial buildings. So I think our objective is to provide as much training and help as we can um, to, to local and state. So certainly, if you want to talk about some opportunities, that we'd be happy to do that. Um, as far as the targeting existing buildings for, for nearly zero, I think we definitely agree that, that that needs to happen as well. And I think the Energy Star program ha has a very strong focus on the existing building market. And I think one thing that's very important there is, is to make sure that you use metrics that are meaningful for the, the whole market so that you don't have the worst buildings completely unmotivated mm -hmm. because they can't don't think they're going to be zero so you need to have a scale that they understand where they fit on that in fact improvement seems at attainable and there's ways to measure that as you go so that you're not expected to go from energy star one to energy star 100 in in one year but that you can see that whole spectrum and when you go from one to 30 you still understand that you've made a significant improvement even though you're not the best building yet. And I think that's one thing that we try to do with our scale is have it be relevant really for the whole market. Um, 
Alan Sandstead from the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Uh, each of you addressed in some way, of course, the, the, um, the outcomes, the effects of labeling, but I'd like to zero in on this a little more. Uh, picking up on Randall Bowie's point about um, uh, the appliance, appliance efficiency labels. There's actually little or no empirical evidence, at least in the United States, that appliance energy labels actually affect purchase behavior. And so I'm wondering uh, what empirical evidence, in, even not on sort of program overall impacts, but even on the micro scale, uh, about what individuals actually do with the information, what is known about this with respect to building energy labels of any kind? Well, as, as far as the um, appliance, I think that's pretty well documented. Uh, Brenda Boardman at Oxford did a very good study about six, seven more than that, eight years ago. Well, cool labels. Not cool. For the United, not for no, the United okay, but I'm just giving the European example. But there, uh, they did show very clearly that there was that that did have an impact on on the appliances, and it also st was even significant correlation with the with the manufacturers. Wait, wait. Impact on the appliances? Oh, on the, okay, I'm just going to the appliances. Now I'll mention the so building. On, on people use, the labels resulted in people purchasing more efficient devices than they ever otherwise would have? Yes. Okay. That's, 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 that's not present in the United States. That you do have that in the, you're in the EU labeling system because you, the, the difference I think there is it's a, it's a harmonized, um, a relatively well harmonized, the, the communications part of the label, which is very important. Is, is harmonized. You have a everyone recognizes it. Uh, that I think gave a lot of um, uh, help to to make it have impact on purchase at point of purchase. There were a lot of member states who trained their uh, salespeople to to point out the the significance of the label and things like that. Uh, those studies were okay. de de so definitely. Is something like this available for buildings? Now the next step, uh, no. <laughs> The answer to that is, at EU level, there is no harmonized um, uh, required labeling uh, scheme. What happens is that the member states are required to develop their own building um, so EPCs, Energy Performance uh, Certificates, they call them, in this EPBD, this uh, Directive on the Building, Energy Performance of Buildings. But it left very much to the member states the details. And I think that was one of the, the weaknesses of the um, of the labeling scheme on buildings, is that it's fragmented. And in, in the um, member states, some have done very well. They've managed to. Uh, I don't want to name individual member states who haven't done too well, but there are some who have not succeeded in getting an impact. But a few, and I mentioned the Netherlands, there there are studies that show significance on the, the real estate values of the labels of the buildings which were given a high um, performance rating. But keep in mind, these are energy use. This is the use phase. It right. doesn't take into account embedded energy or anything. Yeah. That's trying to be developed well, now. I mean, and, 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 the, and the paper by our, our hosts is another example, but that's more of an econometric. What I'm interested in, what I'm wondering is for energy on buildings, uh, you know, scale, uh, studies of exactly what decision makers do with the information and uh, how it affects. I take it from a different angle. Um, what, what, what I'm starting to see on a, on a European-wide basis is when people are making decisions about green buildings, they're taking it f uh, in lots of different respects. One, they're looking at it in terms of risk. So when you start to look at what the label represents, it represents an environmental credibility in terms of what that building performed, but it also actually starts to tell a wider picture. And I think the well-informed in the marketplace, in the real estate market, are starting to understand this, that if you look at things like energy performance, that also means that if energy prices change um, and, and become unstable, then effectively that building might be a, a better risk in terms of investment. Also, and, 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 and research is starting to show this, I've actually got some slides on my laptop I can, I can share with you, is that what, quite a lot of um, uh, investors are starting to see this isn't just purely about the economics of energy, this is also about productivity. So when you start to look at a well-designed space with good air, air quality, good uh, daylighting, you can start to see in a school's environment, for instance, higher levels of exams, higher levels of productivity. You can see um, better office environments in terms of productivity, days off sick. So the well-informed in the real estate are saying, if I want to make an investment into a building, 
I can look at it from a risk perspective in terms of its energy performance, its water consumption, but I can also look at it from a social perspective in terms of what will that mean to the, the people working in that space? What will it do in terms of the, the, how that, the, the, that those staff might, might work? And what's interesting is those financial investors who are starting to say, I am going to buy buildings that are green and certified, that is increasing in number. And I've got some statistics I can share with you, which start to say that people are starting to see this is about a risk issue and a performance issue, not just purely about an energy issue or a water issue. And that is where it's getting exciting because I think um, all rating tools, even in the current downturn, are starting to see a still an increase in the number of buildings that are being registered. That's not because uh, simply people want to differentiate themselves, it's because the business case for certifying is becoming more compelling. Let's take a couple more questions. Well, can, I, can I just react one, okay. add one little word? Quick, to yeah, that. sure. Okay. Quick react. Now, from, um, to sort of follow up on that, the industry, you know, I work quite a bit with industry too. I, I see the building company, the construction companies, two of the largest in, uh, in Europe, Skanska and NCC, have, have definitely moved in exactly that direction. And that's the, the sort of the sad part of it is that it's very difficult to do anything about that at EU level, I think. It, it, it's going to be difficult because of the, <laughs> for the reasons I said, to get agreement, setting some type of a mm. standard, a minimum requirement at EU level for sustainability, because there are so many regional differences. The best that can be done at EU level is to give them a calculation methodology, which is done and there's a standard being developed now, TC350, CIN TC350 will lead to a couple of standards where they give you how to calculate. And these are very much in line with BREEAM at the same time. But to set at EU level a, um, an actual certification system, I think will be difficult. And that's why I think the, there is a bright future for for voluntary schemes, because industry, the market, they're, they're asking for them. I, we see that in the uh, mineral wool insulation uh, business. And the green buildings are, for the, exactly the same reason you said there, there's something that the construction companies are putting resources into. They're building, they want to build them, they know that they can sell them. So the, the market is there, we see it developing. And the same with low energy buildings too. It, it's, it's a market. In fact, my own industry is moving very much in that direction, too. And uh, I don't know if the certification system is going to be able to give, it a, give the new buildings a proper certification, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll take one question from this very patient gentleman over here. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, my name is Stephen Backer, and I'm currently working uh, with a sustainability consulting firm called Urban Green here in San Francisco. Uh, but for the last year and a half or so, I, I was living and working in Dubai. Um, and I was at a sustainability consultant at a large architecture firm there. And, I don't, you know, it, it was sort of popularized. I don't know how much it penetrated. But at the beginning of 2008, there was uh, the Sheik passed the Green Dubai 2008 resolution, which stated all buildings will be green, uh, <laughs> which was just, a, I mean, it was really a mess because nobody really knew what that meant and nobody knew how to implement it. Um, and so the whole game became about getting the rating. And so as the person who had kind of distinguished himself at this firm of being the guy who knew about sustainability, I would have people coming up to me on every different project team day after day, what do we do about the lead? How do we get the lead? Um, and you know, nobody had none, so on the ground you can sort of have you know, the conversation one-on-one -on -one day after day about, you know, it's about holistic strategies and it's about, I mean, you know, everything you're saying, I showed that animal crackers box slide dozens of times to everybody. And, you know, but you're kind of sitting there and, um, you know, market penetration is, is great, that's excellent, and it's about shifting that bell curve. Um, but at, at, one, at some point, uh, you know, you move away from innovation um, and you kind of move towards getting that best practices to as many people as possible. Uh, but so there's this this kind of cowardice among developers that they're they're not really they don't want to push push forward if they don't have to, and there's this sort of bifurcation this paradox that presents itself where you're still trying to get the bulk of people uh, the bulk of new projects and the bulk of bulk of existing buildings moved towards higher performance and you want that to still have value and meaning, but you know as we talk about regenerative buildings and ratcheting up, you know that we want to have that be even even more privileged over the years and kind of still drive people to innovate. And so having you know, this panel, I think one of the questions that came to my mind is, what does it look like? How do you, you kind of go in those two directions and how does that work over the next couple of years? 
to continue to push for innovation, but to continue to try to bring everybody else along? So that's a big question. I'm going to ask my, our panelists to try and be succinct uh, with a response there. <laughs> if I can jump in, I'll just uh, provide a succinct plug for something that we're doing at USGBC that's new that I had uh, wanted to mention anyway, and this has kind of given me an opportunity, and I think it does uh, tie in with what you're asking. Um, uh, LEAD is a voluntary certification system and a consensus-based uh, best practices tool uh, can only do so much to uh, wrest all of the efficiency opportunities out of new and existing buildings. And so we're launching a, a pilot initiative called the Building Performance Initiative. Uh, my colleague is here, Tom Hicks, I think is in the back. Say hi, Tom. <laughs> and um, uh, he's running that initiative. Um, and the idea of that is that because LEED cannot solve all of those problems, or none of these labeling systems, uh, voluntary labeling systems can, as you rightly said, uh, address all the opportunities that exist. Um, we're, we're trying to tackle at least one component of, uh, of the, the, um, the problem that exists even within uh, LEED certification where you may have buildings that meet a great design specification, meet all the construction requirements for green construction and, and materials, and site construction, waste management, and all of that great stuff, uh, but then uh, may not necessarily perform optimally when they're in operations um, for years on down the line. And so um, we're assessing sort of the market the, uh, interest in a set of performance metrics that cover some of the main environmental uh, criteria within the lead rating system, and then working with uh, various data aggregators and um, software type of developer folks to, to figure out how we can put together a kind of a, a simple and powerful um, statement of performance that covers a lot of the aspects that they were trying for in LEED certification. And I think it could be used whether it was a LEED certified building or potentially in the future not. Um, also, you probably know this since you've been doing LEED consulting for a while, but the steering committee that's our membership group that oversees the LEED rating system has passed a measurement and verification requirement. So all LEED projects that certify under V2009, um, which is an, uh, for new construction, um, would have to, within 18 months of uh, opening the building, at least send us their operational data for their energy and their water performance. Uh, we're not evaluating it. We're not going to criticize them if they don't meet a certain mark. But we think that just the activity of asking them to compile it uh, makes them think about it. And it also will help to bridge that gap where you move in the transition from the design team that's really leaves the site and then hands it over to the facilities management group and makes them think more holistically about how they're going to measure the performance for the long term. So I don't know if that really did justice to, to the issues that you were trying to bring out, but those are two things that we're doing to try to move the bar further. I would just make uh, maybe one, one or two quick points. The first is I think you're right. I think that there's a focus that we need on existing buildings and there's a focus that we need on new construction and the, that may not always be the same. And so that's one of the reasons why in my presentation I showed some different kinds of labels and I think it's important that we understand the context of what we're doing. And one of the key things is as we look at these standardized metrics that we have a metric that still has value for the existing building in the bottom quartile that is not going to be zero energy next year. And you need to make sure that within your suite of standardized metrics, you have a metric that's meaningful and that actually serves to motivate rather than discourage that building. And I think if you lose those existing buildings with a focus only on innovation, you're not going to meet the goals. So I think that that you're right, that's a critical element to understand that there's this dichotomy and the policies need to address both. Martin, one quick final comment. Okay, yeah. um, I think it was a different question you asked. Um, I've been in Dubai, I've been to those same conferences you've been to. Uh, I'm not gonna answer your question about innovation because I think if somebody tells you what innovation is, you're missing the point. Innovation is about something new, something different. It might be a material, it might be a product, it might be a service. It's for the industry to pull. You know, rating tools can set new standards, but the industry needs to take a role in this process as well. In that context, in terms of your question, the one thing that frustrates the hell out of me in Dubai, it's about um, 
big and glittery buildings. And I've been in conferences when I've stood up and said, you're not getting it, are you? It's not about building the biggest, shiniest building possible. It's about understanding what the most sustainable building is and how does that building fit in the context of that community. And if you go back and you look around Dubai and you look at some of the historic buildings, which are naturally shaded, naturally cooled, and you look at their relative performance in terms of how much energy they're consuming, some of the solutions are not the new technology. It isn't a technical fix. It is about using and looking at some of the old technologies, which are equally as good as some of the new technologies. And some designers, some good engineers, some good architects are, are realizing that by actually planting around a building and providing natural shading, by using the natural flow of air currents across the building, you can achieve a highly sustainable building at a very low energy footprint. And my challenge to Dubai, as it is to all the other Gulf states, is you have a massive advantage in terms of some of the financial, maybe not Dubai now, but some of the other Gulf states have a massive advantage in terms of being to incubate technologies, which if they get it right, they can use those as export values. So when it comes to innovation, it's down for the industry to decide what's new and exciting. And when it comes to the Gulf states, they really need to think about what buildings have worked for them historically in the context of their climate? And how can they replicate that in a way that is sustainable? Well, we're going to have to cut it there, unfortunately. But uh, obviously, I think that's a great way to end it. Uh, it's about learning lessons that have been around 5,000 years, I think. <laughs> so there we go. <laughs>